So that brings us to our final presentation on lameness diagnosis, the importance of physical inspection. This will be led by a moderator who needs no introduction. However, as the president of the Grace and Jockey Club Research Foundation, much of Mr. Ed Bowen's work goes unrecognized. So please welcome Mr. Bowen and offer our appreciation for his work on behalf of the safety of the horse and the betterment of horse racing. Thank you very much. Uh, going alphabetically, this panel uh, involves uh, Dr. Larry Bramlage, uh, who's a renowned surgeon, as you all know, now with Rudin Riddle, at, formerly of The Ohio State University. We have Dr. Kevin Dunleavy, managing partner, Kentucky Equine Medical Associates, and Dr. Mary Scolay, Equine Medical Director for the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission. Subject is lameness diagnosis, and the importance of it. And these three individuals have differing roles, but inspection is a very big part of their careers. So I want to just start it. Please, panelists, don't feel obligated to wait for me to ask a question. If you want to just chime in and have a conversation, uh, don't, don't, doesn't have to be formal. Let me start it, though, by Dr. Scalay, uh, you, I guess, in the process of being a regulatory veterinarian, you probably s inspect more horses, but you don't have a lot of time with them. Can you just sort of, you've talked about it before, about how important it is for a hands-on inspection of uh, a horse to be cleared uh, to race. So one thing that's always uh, 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 occurred to me, what is your response, what's your conversation with the trainer when you are telling him or her that you're scratching the horse? Do you make a, a diagnosis to tell the trainer why you're scratching him or, or not? Rarely do we make a diagnosis. The type of examination we perform doesn't afford us. Uh, we're not able to do ultrasound, radiographs, diagnostic blocks. We have identified a gait abnormality, uh, an unsoundness, and that is not acceptable to us. In some cases, we may be able to narrow it down. There's heat in the tendon. There's you, you know, resistance to palpation. We can say this needs to be looked at. I think it's almost important that we don't render a diagnosis, because what we've done is identify a horse that needs to have a condition diagnosed, and that's, that's where these guys come in. And I think we're overstepping if we try and come up with a diagnosis with our limited exam and the resources that we have at hand examining the horse on race day. Thank you. Dr. Dunleavy, uh, can you sort of just characterize in your career how, how often you are surprised when a horse that's one of your patients is scratched, or do you usually have an inkling? <laughs> Good luck, Kevin. <laughs> Fortunately, that's a rarity. Uh, if a horse is scratched on day of the race, uh, something's going wrong. Uh, obviously, the, the trainers entered the horse. Uh, the expectation is to be able to run. Uh, the horse is obviously something that th they thought was healthy and, and ready to have a good performance. So it, it typically comes as a surprise. And, and it's obviously something that uh, anxiety is up, but uh, as soon as uh, that call is made, it really does. It starts the whole uh, investigation process to see, uh, to see what is wrong, what's mm -hmm. amiss. Yeah, I see. And then uh, on those occasions that uh, you have a horse that you will want uh, Dr. Bramlage to look at, what, what, what do you, uh, how do you usually make that referral? Do you, do you want to give a specific diagnosis or do you want to just let it be a fresh look by him without, without him having an input as to what you think is, is wrong? Uh, we'll definitely try to establish a diagnosis. Uh, we will do a traditional workup and try to identify it. it really, uh, when Larry ends up getting the case is when uh, uh, we can't come up with a definitive diagnosis and uh, we're looking for more answers. Maybe it's something that's just going to require uh, uh, um, 
a diagnosis or a, a diagnostic tool that we just don't have at the racetrack, uh, nuclear scintigraphy, for instance. Dr. Bramlage, uh, when you're in the news, as you often are, it very, it very often is there's news that a horse has been injured and is being sent to Rudin Riddle for you to do surgery. Uh, is, that, is that the most common way you get a referral, or do you often get horses that it isn't so clear that the, that the media has already announced what's wrong? Well, as Kevin said, I spent three days a week doing surgery, and, and the majority of that time, virtually all that time, they've already got the diagnosis. If a horse has pain, heat, swelling, resistance, deflection, um, any of the usual signs of inflammation, they already know what's wrong, and they're sending it for, to get something done about it. Um, two days a week, there are horses that their main complaint is um, they have poor performance. Mm -hmm. They're not wanting to go to the track. They have no identifiable um, lesions. The trainer and veterinarian know that there's something wrong, but there's, the horse is not giving them any clue as to where it is, and that's when we use the things like nuclear scintigraphy. Uh, there's also advanced imaging, and occasionally we have people say, um, this horse has something wrong. We want a high-field MRI. We want to do all the available joints. 32 hours of general anesthesia is a little bit intimidating because <laughs> high field MRIs, you've got to know, an MRI is a very good tool, uh, but you have to know where to put it. Uh, you can't do the whole, the whole horse joints. I mean, it's an hour and a half to two hours to get a pair of fetlocks, for instance. Um, so you've got to know where it's at. So with those horses, we do use scintigraphy. We do use... Uh, radiography, we do use occasionally the MRI, but the majority of the exam is done with physical inspection and diagnostic nerve blocks. Because if you just x-ray every hot spot in the horse um, that shows up on scintigraphy, you're going to spend a lot of money needlessly, and you'll be x-raying a lot of sites where there's no pain. So it's still done with physical exam, a good part of the exam. Um, and the one thing that by the time they, he sends one to us, we've got all afternoon to work on it, or all morning or yeah. something. And that's uh, because we're working on several at the same time and being able to go through it. And that's sometimes not possible at the racetrack where um, there's other things going on. Uh, there's no spot maybe where you can get away from all of the hubbub and getting the horse to relax in a, in a situation where you can get a good look at all four limbs is a big deal. Dr. Dunlavy, uh, how, how, how much does the x-ray uh, work into your, to what you're doing with the horse? Do you use that a lot before you make the decision that you need to, to refer to, to a, a surgeon? Sure. Uh, radiography is a daily occurrence. Um, you know, the, the vast majority of horses that we're going to see at the racetrack, they're going to be characterized into two groups. It's musculoskeletal and respiratory. And so from a musculoskeletal perspective, uh, radiography is going to be a really important tool. So um, uh, every day I go through and, and, and look at a handful of horses. And, um, you know, that's something that just uh, uh, does occur on a daily basis. What is the current uh, level of assurance of uh, radiography? Going from track to track, different machines, uh, has the science of x-ray improved enough over the years that you don't worry about whether you're getting a lesser quality x-ray Tuesday at one track as you got Saturday as another? Well, uh, needless to say, radiography has improved greatly. Uh, digital radiography is the, the mainstay now. Uh, the ability to capture good images um, is available. I think the vast majority of people are using it. So uh, across the board on the racetrack, I, I think uh, it, it's improved greatly with the technology that's come along. It's, it's so different. Uh, I mean, Kevin looked at me because he, he was still in elementary school when I saw my first radiograph. With me. We literally, when I was a student, dipped them in the developing bin and looked up, and, and we were lucky to see 
if we could identify what part of the horse we'd x-rayed. It varied with machines, it varied with um, electricity, um, the voltage of, in what you were shooting with your machines. Uh, I don't think any one thing has changed probably, uh, maybe the endoscope from the, from, has changed a lot, but has made as many advances as digital radiography. It doesn't depend upon one track to the other. It doesn't depend upon your electrical voltage anymore okay, because okay. you get an image and the majority of the of the picture, the information on the detail is done by computer with algorithms which can correct our current interns, they're terrible at taking x-rays because they l rely on the computer for everything and they just get close with the x-ray machines and, and you know, sometimes you, you've got to um, hit them with the crop a little bit in order to, in order to make them pay attention to is doing a good job of radiography. Is that spell check in your world? Uh, yeah, I think uh, <laughs> it's automatic spell check, it, it, but it doesn't insert as many wrong words as my spell check does when I'm typing. Well, Dr. Scott, go ahead. I think Larry makes an important point that um, the person driving the machine can make a big difference in the quality of the films. And when I was in vet school, shortly after you, after fire, before wheel, mm -hmm. to take Fedlock films, it was four views. That was it. And so we've had situations, Derby Week, when we wanted to look at a horse more closely, and Dr. Liz Sanchi, who comes in to help us, she'll say, I want, and she'll ask for a view that I've not seen, wasn't trained to look for. And so I think the person who's taking the films and directing the positioning is probably more important than the, the modality itself anymore. It's certainly more important than the machine. Uh, yes. I mean, there are still veterinarians who can take bad sets of x-rays. Uh, you know, the, really? you have to know the angle you want. And uh, our understanding of the diseases that it has advanced so much more that's added views to virtually everything that that we do, and that came as a direct result of the evolution of the x-ray machine. You know, I mean, it used to be if there were an extra chunk in a, in a fetlock joint, yeah, we knew that was a chip fracture, but now we're looking for changes in the trabecular pattern and uh, whether the horse is impacting the bone in the front of the joint or uh, has a problem in the back. Uh, it's, you, you know, the, I'd like to think the veterinarians have become more sophisticated too. Dr. Scully, I know you've been uh, right in the forefront, been very influential in making the, the industry aware of the need of, of uh, inspect of, uh, pre race inspections. Do you have on the tip of your head that wonderful statistic you have given us about the number of horses that you scratched that never raced? So this goes back to some retrospective data well, I just from Florida. To, I've, sure. I've always been so uh, impressed by that number, and I think it just illustrates in one sentence how important pre-race inspections are. That was a hint, one sentence, okay. 22.3% uh, of horses that we scratched in Florida for unsoundness, so this wasn't flipped in the gate, these weren't colics, these were horses we determined to be unsound, 22.3% of them never raced again. I think that's good. Dr. Dunlavy. Uh, uh, Ed, can I say something? I think sure. this, this deserves a big push. Mary and Rick and Lynn Havda and all the regulatory veterinarians, if you boil it down to one sentence, a regulatory veterinarian is now a profession. Yeah. Whenever, whenever I graduated from veterinary school, it was, it, the odds are it was a retired small animal veterinarian who was spending his afternoons at the races. Uh, it's changed a lot. Yeah. Dr. Donnelly, uh, do you have a sense of just in the last few years, uh, uh, do, you, do you see an impact of the increased emphasis on pre-race inspections? Can you kind of have a sense that that's, that's helping your, your clientele? Well, the, the simple fact of pre-race inspections have changed. They've become much more involved in uh, and the trainers know that, that the horses are going to be subject to it. Um, I, I look at it as a as a win-win. Uh, we're all after the same common goal: uh, the overall health of the horse. Um, uh, so, really, uh, the relationship between myself and the state vets uh, is, is one of um, I, I'd like to think more collaboration. It's definitely not one of of animosity. I, I know I've, uh, 
more times than not, they've either, we've uh, expressed uh, different feelings on, on a horse, uh, what's been going on, can you give me some history, and try to share that information. So, um, you know, as far as the, uh, the pre-race exams, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think they're, I think people realize they're part of the industry now and, and they're welcome. Good, good. Now, uh, Dr. Scully, I think I touched on this a little bit, but you said you don't give a diagnosis, uh, which I understand why, but, but do you often have pushback from a trainer who's trying to get you to say, well, you know, I know this horse walked away this way, but he warms out of it. Is that, do you find, do you find a certain finesse a necessary part of that relationship, or do you just say, well, I, the horse is lame, and that's all I need to think about? Well, I mean, yes to both. I mean, sometimes it comes down to, I'm glad you think this horse is fine, but I can't buy it, and we can't go forward here. We're not running that experiment during a race. You think he's okay, and, and I don't believe that. Um, more often, it is a conversation. The trainer says, you know, I, I know this horse. I've, I've trained him a long time. He's always been a funny moving horse, and and I appreciate that, you know, there can be sound horses that are funny moving horses. And so we try and work with trainers there. We've, we've had a number of trainers in Kentucky who will come to us before they enter a horse and say, I want you to look at this horse because you see him on race day and that's the first time you see him, you're not going to like him. But I'm going to train him tomorrow morning. I want you to see him. I want you to see him cool out. And I want you to develop, you know, a level of comfort with him. So I, I think, you know, the relationship has grown. And I view a scratch as, to a certain extent as a failure. Either we failed to communicate where our line is in the sand with regards to a horse's condition, or something has happened to the horse that the trainer was not aware of, you know, and that's, that's when we have to intervene. I will say sometimes we've had people who say, um, you know, you're right, he doesn't look good. We've had our vet look at him and he can't find anything. And somehow the feeling is that because the lameness couldn't be diagnosed, therefore it was negated, it's not lame anymore. And my answer there is, well, but the horse is still lame. You still need to look for a diagnosis. So it's an interesting dynamic. I, w I think our veterinarians are a little more nuanced in those conversations than perhaps I was back in the day. Um, but I, it's, it's a learning process. Dr. Dunlevy, when you're dealing with trainers, do you, do you find that uh, over the years, do you, do you think that most trainers grasps the difference between the, uh, the, the lameness as a symptom or do a lot of trainers think that covering, covering the symptom is what the, the goal should be or do you find most of your trainers understand that it's a symptom of something else and finding that something else is, is the job? I think most trainers adhere to the philosophy that if you don't train well, you're probably not going to perform well. And so um, along that line, uh, as far as lameness is concerned, I think people try to uh, identify it and address it beforehand. Um, you want to have the horse in uh, doing as well as it possibly can. And that's where a lot of the diagnostics have, uh, have come along. I mean, the ability to have uh, instant imaging, whether it be ultrasound or x-ray, uh, the fact that the trainer can be involved in there. It's really, we've, we've educated the trainer much more today. It's a trainer who's, who can uh, literally watch uh, part of the, the workup. So, um, you know, the goal is to have the horse in as good a condition as possible. That's where we're going to get the best performance. And, uh, you know, just to follow on just a couple of Mary's uh, comments there. Uh, I've encouraged clients, if, if there's a question that we have that a horse maybe just travels in such a way that they're not really fluid, uh, show that to the state vet a week before the race. Uh, let's not wait till race day. If we, if we think it's a non-factor, then let's identify that early on. But uh, um, uh, it's pretty, sum, pretty much sums it up. Dr. Bramlage. You know, it's popular to say we don't have the horsemen we used to. I mean, that's you hear that being repeated over and over. And that may or may not be true. I, I'm, I, I don't want to pass a judgment on that. But I do think that trainers are, 
the, the trainers who are paying attention are evolving out of the concept that the lameness is the disease and that the lameness is a sign that something else is going on. And, they, and they're also a, uh, gradually evolving in the sense that they understand that the, the worst injury you can make with maybe not the, the uh, serious worst injury, Mary's supposed to stop those, but <laughs> racing a horse poorly is no advantage for anybody. It's not an advantage for the owner. It's not an advantage for the trainer. And they are more and more in tune with the fact that unhappy horses don't race well and there's something going on. Really fit, healthy horses love to train. And I mean, I would say for the most part, 99% of them, they really like to train. Even the ones, they're amazing with musculoskeletal pain. Even the ones that are really hurting, they still like to train. Um, and so, and they get to a certain point, and if all of a sudden they're not wanting the train, there's something going on. And the trainers are, are better than they used to be at recognizing that. Is that right? That's it. That's good to know. Dr. Dunleavy, at, uh, at conferences like this, I remember a Last year, maybe two years ago, there was a lot, a lot of comment about the importance of the, the relationship with the racetrack veterinary and the trainer and the owner. The owner is supposed to be a full partner. Is that, does, does that, how, how naive or not naive is that? Do most of your trainers, you know, welcome the owner's input and keep the owner informed, do you think? Don't put him on the spot, is it? <laughs> Well, it, it's purely by uh, the dynamics of the way it is. I mean, the bottom line is the veterinarian sees the horse trainer every single day. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, a, it's a daily conversation, whereas the owner is uh, typically, you know, not on location. Uh, it, it's, it's not a common thing for me to have a, a rapport with the owner just because um, they're, they're typically not available. Um, you know, where I find the, the, the best solution to that is just communi communication, where if there's a good dialogue between the veterinarian, the trainer, and the owner, then there's, a, there's never much of a problem. What, what, where we run into a problem is where there's been a breakdown in, in that communication. So, um, you know, I, I welcome it when I have an opportunity to speak to an owner. Uh, I think it definitely includes uh, what's going on with the horse and what's being done. Uh, so uh, I, I enjoy it when I, when I get that opportunity, but it's, it, it is a rarity. Is it? Okay. Okay. Mary, and, and your observing of other stables, would you say that's pretty much the same thing? Your, your impression of the relationship of owner trainer vet? Um, um, I don't know that we have much to comment on, the, the owner relationship, I mean, it is very rare that we deal with an owner. Oh, yeah, I'm just, I'm yeah. just talking about from your observations of other stables. I don't mean in your, right. in I, your, line, your line of communication, but... Uh, I guess I'm saying I, I don't know that we're in the barns at that time to observe yeah, okay. that relationship, so I don't know I can, I can answer that. Okay. okay. Dr. Bramlage, you were talking about uh, in, in, increased equipment. I remember uh, it's hard to believe how long ago uh, uh, nuclear scintigraphy first came around. I remember you've always warned against thinking it's a lameness meter. I wonder if, if do, do you think that the improvement that you've just articulated with x-rays has lessened the impact and the amount of usage of nuclear scintigraphy? Would you have imagined in 25 years, it would be more prominent than it is, in other words? Uh, no. I think as a proportion, the, the digital x-ray machine has reduced the number, the, pro the proportion of horses that get nuclear scintigraphy. I think many of the diagnoses get made up front um, by Kevin or some people, whereas uh, even 10 years ago, um, you didn't have the ability to image the anatomy that well, so you had to look at the physiology, which is what the nuclear scintigraphy um, does. But 
the well-training horse has a very active bone scan as well. And, you know, if, it, it, if you take a race horse and you show it to a veterinarian who works only on show horses, they, they start shaking. You know, the, there's hot spots everywhere. <laughs> but in a race horse, that's normal because nuclear scintigraphy measures only one thing. That's where, where people get uh, mixed up. It measures only bone production. It doesn't measure bone breakdown. Um, so you have to view that in the right context. And, you know, there's the, there are some new drugs that slow bone remodeling to the point where I, I definitely think we've seen horses that have reduced activity on bone scan because of uh, ongoing um, treatment regimes. And, and so I think we have to be careful of understanding all the, the the different imaging modalities. And then we're not done yet. There, as, as Dr. Kauchek said, three-dimensional imaging in the form of the standing CT is not very far away. Um, and it will be another step forward. Um, the trouble is, is you start finding so many things, and then you got to sort through them and understand which ones are normal and which ones aren't. So there's a learning curve on everything you do. We did the same thing on digital radiography. We saw so many things that scared us. Um, and then you begin to learn what they mean. Yeah, that reminds me of uh, Risen Star. He came out of the Belmont in 88, and I've forgotten what the new development was, and he had this wonderful veterinarian, but he looked at this, and he, he couldn't know if those lesions had always been there or not, so they, they retired the horse rather than run the risk that they... They were, they were finding something new, so I know that's, that's an odd it case. It takes but. understanding, research, and experience yeah. um, with the modality as well as, you know, the, the number of those that you see put whatever you're seeing in a different perspective. Yeah. Well, uh, Mary and Dr. Dunleavy, uh, I don't know how you felt about this earlier panel with the just slide after slide of improper medication. Uh, I don't like to be cynical, but what what would you how would you kind of characterize the uh, the uh, uh, the degree of impropriety that you are aware of or afraid is still on the backstretch? Did you see this as a whole bunch of oddities or thing like a pattern to me? How do you how do you feel about that? You want to take this? You want me to start? Thank you. Um, I think probably like any any business, any sport, there there is a, a sector of those who will push the envelope. I don't think it is pervasive, but yeah. I think that the fact that it exists is very very troubling. Um, in a couple of occasions, I've I've spoken with trainers who had or used some of these products that, from my perspective, are unknowns. They've got a label. The label is very compelling, but you should not equate that with what is or isn't in that vial because there's no quality control on the manufacturer of that product. And the thought of putting an unknown into my beloved pet horse is horrifying. And so I try and convey that to the people who've become sort of inured to using it. I mean, I had one veterinarian say, I've just used it so long, I feel comfortable with it. And when you say, do you know what's in it? He's like, yeah, no. So I think part of my job when these things appear, and they don't appear every day, but when they do, is to kind of have a reality check and say, do you realize what you're doing here? Take a step back and hear what you're saying, and, and are you comfortable with that? Could you tell that to your mother and she'd say you're doing good? Um, and I think that's part of what our job is. But I, I don't think it's pervasive. I think it's out there, but it's not, it's not overwhelming our industry. Good, good. Dr. Dun, uh, Dr. Dunlevy, there was a, I believe that one of the panelists made the comment of, uh, they were aware that some, sometimes a, a trainer would use something and the veterinarian wouldn't know that they were using it. Have you, are, are you able to have a clientele that if that happens to you, you kind of move on to a different situation? I think my initial answer there would be, first, I don't think there's anything more unpopular than uh, a trainer that's got a call from the stewards and that they have a medication violation. 
Uh, that's the, the worst phone call you can get. And, you know, the vast majority of uh, trainers that, that I work for, they want to abide by the rules. What are the rules are? Uh, and, and I think that's reflected in, in the numbers. I mean, when there's violations, it's typically it's therapeutic medication. Um, beyond that, uh, sure, it, those products that came up on the slides, have I seen those products before? I have. Uh, I, the only way I can uh, categorize that it's as individual as every one of us. I mean, some people have the common cold and take no medication, get rest, and the next person has a, a medicine cabinet that looks like a Walgreens pharmacy. Uh, <laughs> it's it's uh, and, and that's held over into uh, looking for ways to uh, to treat horses. Uh, it's unfortunate that. Uh, you know, horseprerace.com uh, exists out there, but it, it, it does. And, uh, and now with the internet, the, uh, the ability to obtain those products is, is uh, at the click of your fingertips. So, um, you know, it'll, it'll be there. I, you know, all we can do is really discourage it. And, uh, and also, I mean, there's anything uh, that discourages as much as just what was presented today, that the vast majority of the products don't even have what uh, uh, they, they say or they're labeled for. So, yeah. I think we ought to refer that question to the Russian Olympic Committee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm glad to hear the opinion that it's not pervasive. Yeah, that's, that's, that'd be a good point, good point. Okay, now you all have anything you want to just sort of spontaneously bring up or? I want to talk about Tim's 65 percent. About what? The, the Tim Parkin. Oh, yeah. His okay. slide with the 65 percent of we can't, we don't know what reduced those racing fatalities. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you for one word. Depomedrol. Corticosteroids. Yeah, well, corticosteroids are still around. Yes. But the the thing about I think the reduction in the use of Depomedrol has kept the status of the horse truer to the, the, the real thing. And it's made your job and Kevin's job somewhat easier because you can keep, I won't speak for him, I'll let him talk for him, but um, even from my aspect, whenever we're seeing him down the line, the trainers and veterinarians are more aware of the status of the horse because the half-life of Depomedrol is so long that when you put it into a joint, it will often overlap the next injection if the trainer is in the habit of treating a joint rather frequently. And pretty soon, nobody has a means of assessing where the horse is in the um, disease process. Um, so I, I think the, the corticosteroid regulations, but that corticosteroid in particular because of its long duration, um, a, if you were able to unravel that 65% would be a big chunk of those. I, a, agreed. Um, and I did steward CE last week at UofL, and so I went through our scratches over the last several years, sort of pre-corticosteroid regulations, post-corticosteroid post regulations. So pre-140, 130, 126 a year, just lameness. This isn't the flippers and whatnot, colics, just horses lame. Last year, 101. I mean, and so that says to me that the trainers aren't entering horses that aren't right because they've now got an opportunity to get a good look at the horse and make a better decision about whether or not that horse should run. And I ran into a veterinarian uh, Churchill Derby Week, and he'd been one of the people, as the corticosteroid regulations were being unfolded, he's like, oh, no, no, no. And I saw him, and I said, how are you doing? He said, I get to be a veterinarian again. He said, my clients are asking me to look at horses. They want a diagnosis. And he was happy as he could be because he's getting to do what he was trained to do, which is examine, diagnose, and recommend treatment. So I, I think it's improved our ability to assess the horse at every point of contact. I, I totally agree with that. I mean, I'm, Kevin probably has a comment too, but I think it made the good veterinarians better, and the veterinarians who... You can use corticosteroids still, yes. but you got to know where to put them because you can't just put them in all the joints like occasionally happened before. So the veterinary opinion becomes more important as to 
what's going on with the horse and how we treat it. I, I, uh, agreed. Uh, the the importance there is uh, the effect. Uh, if you've if you've done a, a joint injection, you've done a therapeutic treatment, and you want to see the the response to that treatment, and so uh, now uh, you have you have a better chance of actually being able to assess the horse. Uh, you know how how is the lameness score now? How does uh, do we really did we do we change the gait? What was uh, what was improved? Um, and so really using it as a tool, and it, it just allows you to evaluate a little bit better. And, and many times the trainers weren't realizing, I think, what they were doing. Some, some of them, there are people on both ends of the spectrum, but they weren't realizing at how long what they actually were doing was affecting the horse. Uh, and then so then that weighs into this scenario, are we treating the lameness, are we treating the disease? And if you're... If you're using corticosteroids with that long a duration, I mean, that's how some trainers judge the, the efficacy of what you do, and that is how long does it last, when in actual fact, that's probably not a good perspective to take. I can't hear. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. We're, we're having our questions from up here. Kathy, do you have any questions? Tweet it up there or whatever yeah, you do to yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, whatever you do. I'm not on Twitter or Facebook, so. <laughs> okay. All of us have opinions, but from the horses that I see, I think we have a better handle on where the horse is when we're doing the exams. Uh, I'll, I'll stick with my opinion. Larry, have you seen, uh, have you been aware of a shift in the, the type of surgeries that are brought to you, the type of injury? Is there any dynamic there in the last 10 years or so? Oh, sure. Um, and, and, and the... That has been a continuous evolution since uh, the the the, um, the Americans actually invented the cold light source, but the Japanese figured out how to use it with the arthroscope and uh, and all that, and then the Germans perfected the instruments, and then Wayne McElwraith looked at it when he was doing his PhD, and we all began doing arthroscopy. That becomes a first line of defense now with with many injuries and to take arthroscopy, which is 25 years old, to the last 10 years, more and more trainers are realizing that it's just not the chunk in the joint that's causing the problem, but, but that the impact damage in the front of the joint, in a fetlock joint, for instance, impact damage in the front of the joint is shedding debris, and that's affecting the horse's performance, and that's why the corticosteroid injections aren't lasting very long, uh, unless you go back to using Depomedrol. And so... They're thinking in terms of, um, let's step in. Um, we're going off to Saratoga next week. Um, we'll get something done with this horse's ankles, and he'll be ready to go by the time we come back, whenever we come back here and train. And I think that's a, a, an evolution that's becoming more and more prominent of stepping in on those uh, various diseases when there's no grass races for this grass horse, or it's a management of the individual, um, uh, and that's changed in the last few years. And some of it is um, increase in knowledge, and some of it's increased in diagnostic capabilities, and some of it's increased in the acceptance of various treatment uh, methods. I mean, you know, you do a lot of that stuff at assessing what the horse's future is um, in the near and long term. I, I don't know if you have a comment about that. Well, I don't, the, I don't ever, excuse me, go ahead. Uh, I guess there were a, a couple of comments there too. Uh, I, I think it has definitely evolved for, for sure, the understanding of corticosteroids and the effect. I mean, when I was early on in practice, we. The, the dosage, we, we would use a, a much higher milligram dosage. Obviously, you don't need that high of dosage. We, we've continued to back that down. Um, 
Yeah, I, it still is a challenge, though. I, I've got to admit, in practice right now, to uh, to stay within the guidelines, and and that's a that's also a, an event that occurs at least for the racetrack practitioner is making sure that uh, that you're abiding by those. And when we have a guideline that establishes one joint at seven days, the question is, is how far do we need to back it up if we're doing a therapeutic treatment and we're doing more joints? Um, that is a challenge, and it, it's one of those things that we're that you have to kind of work through on a, on a daily basis. I think it's always interesting if you listen to your average NFL game to where they, yeah. uh, you can't give a horse uh, a corticosteroid injection in one of these joints a week before the race, but they go get them at halftime, you know I mean? <laughs> and it's like a badge of honor. He took a shot and it's going to be, and that's not corticosteroids. That's a local anesthetic because corticosteroids not going to work for the second half, you know? So, and, and it's, I mean, you know, this stuff going on, the perspective of people is so different um, with what people do to themselves or, or, or what we're responsible for with horses. I mean, there's a good, there's a good to that, but it also has its weak side in, in the sense that they don't understand what's good training and good veterinary care as well. I know we've had uh, in this organization a discussion, uh, I was reminded of it today, talking about, thinking about Woodbine. Do you, have you been in any contact with any of the veterinarians or trainers of des describing uh, the uh, racing the other way in those races at Woodbine. I doubt if there's been enough, doesn't happen enough yet to, to have any judgment about whether that relieves the pressure on one leg or so forth. But do you have an, have an inkling or, or an opinion about whether that's going to be beneficial if it can, if it can proliferate? I don't think it makes any difference, in my personal opinion, because almost all the injuries that we're dealing with are repetitive stress injuries. So it's not, you know, it's it's like the uh, it will sometimes have owners that say, well, um, horse has bad knees. We'll switch him to the grass because grass is easier on his knees. He's still got to train on the dirt. You can't train on the grass every day. You got to send him to Europe, maybe, yeah. um, and there you could train on the grass because. There is evidence that um, it, it's a bit easier on uh, certain areas of the horse, one of, the, one of those being on the, the um, carpal joints, although European horses have plenty of carpal problems. So um, it, it, it's, it's the training and the repetitive stress, because the truth is, as we've talked about so many times before, is you got to damage a horse a little bit in order to make him stronger. And it's an overload, over repair, or you got to damage a human athlete a little. You got to damage yourself a little bit in order to make yourself stronger. And so, just racing in a different direction, I, I doubt whether it'll have much effect. It, it's an sure. interesting question, though, because some years ago, Bill Hartack and I had a discussion, and he firmly believed that there were left-handed horses and right-handed horses. So, left sure. side dominant and right side dominant. He'd ridden in this country for many years. Then he went to Hong Kong when his weight got a little tough to handle. Mm -hmm. And so it was his perspective that some of the best race horses in this country were horses that were really left-sided dominant, um, and that the horses that were right-sided dominant, maybe they didn't get hurt, but they couldn't be as successful. They simply weren't as athletic. Um, and I know that's never really been investigated, but I thought it was an, a really interesting point from somebody who'd dealt with horses going, horses for courses. Um, so, <laughs> Donna? <laughs> I, I, it's a, I know I think training both directions might make more sense, but I know and we certainly have injuries that predominate in one limb or the other. Um, uh, the the dorsal cortical stress fractures the is the big one, um, but that's a very complicated mix of intensity of exercise as opposed to. Um, actually only the direction and then when your intensity of exercise moves up the the axis of principal strain moves to the lateral side and and they spend more time going left so they get a they get a higher number of injuries there but when we look at other sort of injuries there are idiosyncrasies like um, 
Displaced condylar fractures are much more common on the right front than they are on the left front. But I think that has to do with how the lead leg performs. Uh, the lead leg is actually spared in that situation. So that when that's on the inside, whenever they're going around the turn, I think that accounts for that difference that we see. But the incidence of the distal cannon bone diseases as across the spectrum, um, it's, in, it's just pretty much equally distributed. I uh, no comment except for it'll be interesting in morning training when we reverse reverse direction. <laughs> I'm sorry, you do you do. That's been tried do. a couple of times. The horseman hated it. Right? <laughs> Kathy, do we have any questions from you? Caught me off guard. <laughs> Um, in response to the 65% um, reduction in, in missing information from the EID, um, it was stated that um, you, a lot of you believed it was the Depamedrol. Is that for the entire 65% reduction or just um, a portion of that? And then also for the um, states that may have lower um, breakdown rates than the national average, um, that may have no change in their corticosteroid regulation, do you have any thoughts on what the reduction may have been? Well, since I said the word depomedrol, it's absolutely not the entire. I mean, that, that's a huge amount, but, but I think it's a portion of it. I would have given a credit for a portion of the improvement over the entire time to, to Mary's profession, like I said before, but I think the acute change is most likely that change in the approach to treatment. Um, and so not the entire 65%, but some of it. What was the other part? Oh, the states that hadn't adopted the regulation, how can you attribute a reduction in fatalities for them? And I think that um, A, it is multifactorial. B, there are a number of ways to mitigate risk, and if you've got increased risk in one area and you offset it by mitigating in another area, it, it can be a wash or an overall improvement. So I, I think that um, we can't just focus on one thing, but I was responding to, to Tim's question mark on the 65%, and I, I certainly think that corticosteroid plays a, a big, corticosteroid regulation pays, plays a big role in that. Well, as, if you said, Sometimes the, the class level of horses also has an, have an influence. So that has an influence in owner, trainer. Uh, the, in, in some racing jurisdictions, the owner and the trainer are the, same, are, are the same person. And that horse may not be able to afford corticosteroid injections, so they don't get them. But whenever, uh, you know, I was at Columbus for quite a while, um, whenever we would see horses coming in, when it was still okay to stack uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatories, they, they would stack them pretty high um, because it, w it was more economical. So uh, um, I think the corticosteroid injection is not a universal scenario, but I believe, it's, I believe it's a component. Well, and I think the business model of the individual racetrack certainly impacts the long-term health of the horse. I I've talked about this before, where we had one racetrack here in Kentucky that um, relatively lower classes of horses race there, lower purses. It's, um, it's not a vacation destination. Um, and yet it was associated with the lowest, lowest occurrence of fatalities over an extended period of time. And I think a lot of it had to do with the, the dynamic there that the people who trained horses, they were smaller operations, they couldn't afford an empty stall, they couldn't afford an injured horse, they couldn't afford a lot of veterinary care, so they had a good understanding of their horse's condition. If that horse wasn't right, they didn't lead him over because they knew whatever he was at the end of the race, they were bringing him home. And so that business model favored the long-term health of the horse because the trainers had to take care of their horses. There was no opportunity to have turnover, bring another horse in, and, and just move on. And so I think that there are other dynamics that can improve decision-making. And they don't train as hard, and they often don't train as fast. Right. And, and yeah. I, I, I agree. I mean, it just, I, I think, again, it's multifactorial, and you can't just attach it to one thing. But taken together, whether it be um, the change in medication, the ability to assess, the, the pre-race exams, so that, that seems it's just consensus. Are, are you, uh, are any of you <coughs> surprised 
about the ongoing statistic that in this country, the shorter races have more risk factor, have more, a higher percentage of injury. So I've spent some time looking at that, and, and I, I think I understand it, because those shorter races tend to be just either flat out or continual acceleration. I mean, some yeah. of the quarter horse races, they just keep going faster and faster until they get to the wire. Um, so, you know, I think maybe the conventional wisdom was at one time, the longer the horse is racing, the more likely he is to be at risk of injury. But I think in the route races, there are, there are intervals where risk is reduced because there's more time to be strategic, more patient, place the horse, wait for an opportunity. Um, so it makes sense to me. I, I also don't know how to handicap the overwhelming no I know it's proportional in the statistical, but the overwhelming number of six furlong races compared to everything else, you know, I mean, or six or seven, and then the, that, that, depending on what track you are with that, that distance, I, I don't know how that fits in. I mean, I think it must, it must have some factor. Well, Tim's done the math, so I trust him. <laughs> Anything else, Kathy? Okay, well, thank you very much. Well, I appreciate you all coming. I appreciate Keeneland's hospitality. For those of you who signed up for the extra meeting at 5, uh, just come on over. I'll be there. And uh, Donna, would you like to come up and uh, bid us adieu? Well, it's been a long day for everyone. Thanks for coming. I'll be brief. Um, thank you to all the panelists, all the presenters, and hope to see you back here next year for what's now become an annual uh, WSS, Welfare and uh, Safety of the Racehorse Summit, and next year will be the eighth annual. Thank you for coming.